You know, I just, I'm at a place in my life. I just want to be led by God. How about you? Amen. Amen? Just want to be led. Just want to be led by the Holy Spirit. And uh, God is doing some amazing things here. And we give him all the glory. I believe we're at a very pivotal hour uh, in our nation's history. And we need to pray, church. I mean, that's the, look, people are watching. The world is watching. Would you agree? Uh, we should not be uh, surprised in what's happening because these are very perilous times. That's what the apostle said, right? He said there are times uh, at the end, uh, Jesus said there'd be wars and there's rumors of wars. There would be brother would be turned against brother, right? Think about it. Uh, nation against nation. There'd be great division. And so we shouldn't be surprised when we see a lot of the chaos that we're now seeing in the day and age in which we're living. Jesus said, when all these things happen, look up, your redemption draweth nigh. Amen? And I don't know about you, but I am a little bit homesick for, for heaven, right? On this world, they can, listen, when the Lord says, are you ready to ride with me? I'm out of here. Amen? When I was a kid, I had a t-shirt. It used to say it had two pairs of sneakers on there, you know, and uh, it had like these feet jetting out of them. And it said, get right or get left. <laughs> so get right or get left. Amen. And, uh, the, you know, the, today you see three chairs behind me. And I'm going to ask this question periodically through this message to you today. What chair do you sit in? What chair do you sit in? Let's go to the word this morning, Judges chapter 2 and verse 10. It says, after that generation died, that's Joshua's generation. We'll talk about that in a little bit. After that generation died, another generation grew up who did not acknowledge the Lord or remember the mighty things he had done for Israel. When I was a little boy growing up, it seemed like my mom was always in the kitchen working and cooking things. Anybody have a mom like that? Just so busy, you know, and four kids. Can you imagine? I had my oldest brother, Paul, my other brother, Phil, my sister, Marilee, who was just in last weekend. It was good to see her. And then how many know they saved the best for last? Amen? <laughs> this little rebellious preacher's kid that turned out to be a preacher. I mean, go figure. How many know all things are possible then to believe, right? Praise God. You can run, but you can't hide, right? But we had, you know, in our home, we had these chairs around our table. And although, you know, us four kids, no one had to tell us where to sit. Our, you know, names weren't on our seats, but we all sat pretty much in the same chair. How many of you grew up in a home like that? You just pretty much knew it was time for dinner, time for lunch. You sat in the same chair. There's one chair that we never sat in because my dad had a commanding presence, and that was his chair. You have a father like that? And dad's like a gentle giant. You know, he talks uh, quietly, but he carries a big stick. And when I was a kid, and I know this is going to sound abusive to some of you, but just, just bear with me a minute, okay? Uh, put the thin skinness aside. If I got in my dad's chair like as a joke, you know what he would do, Jay? You know how they were back then. They, they just, you know, they, he grabbed me by the ear. <laughs> and he just twist that thing until I, and he guided me into the right chair. Right? And even, I mean, it was a point like we had, we always had people over our house in those days. But um, we always tell them, don't sit in my father's chair, okay? In my house, I sit at the head of the table because how many know the man is the head of the house? All right. Oh, I, oh, this is old school. Oh, my God. This is really, did I lose you already? Oh, boy. Where's those scriptures we were reading last week in Ephesians? And somebody says, yes, but the woman is the neck that turns the head. No, I don't remember seeing that one in there. But anyways... So throughout life, you see these different chairs, and I'm going to reference these today. Commitment, compromise, conflict. And so, you know, throughout school, grade school, Brother Gary, I, I remember, you know, being involved with the marching band, that kind of thing, and, you know, middle school, like sixth grade, right? And I wanted to be, how many of us, I'm, I'm a pretty mean musician, amen? No, I'm just, I'm just kidding. I'm just having fun with you. But I always want to be in that, what they called, and I don't know if you guys remember this, it was called the first chair, how many remember that in the band? Okay, you get it? So you had to really work hard to get in the first chair. I mean, you know, that wasn't for, for guys that were goofing off. There were guys that were, they were really working on their, their gift, whether it was playing the trombone or, you know, whatever. So first chair was a chair of honor, okay? And then you think about, like, different chairs, right? Like basketball. When I play basketball, 
The guy that sat in the first chair next to the coach, how many know he was the guy that was going to go in? He was going to get a lot of playing time. If you were sitting somewhere in the back, just forget about it. You weren't even going to be involved in the game, okay? But first chair was a place of honor. I want to say to you today, the first chair I want to talk to you about is the chair of commitment. Everybody say commitment. And then we're going to talk about the chair of compromise and the chair of conflict. And the Bible gives us great examples of this, these three levels. And I want to say this to you today. Every one of us in this room is in one of those three places. Every one of us. You know, uh, Ivy League schools, Harvard, Yale, Princeton, what's the one thing they have in common besides their uh, Ivy League? Expensive, thank you. That's a good word, John. Yeah, it's a good word. <laughs> Praise God. Uh, I don't know how many of you know this or realize this, but they actually originally were founded to be Bible colleges. And the only textbook, everybody looked this way, was the Word of God. That was the only textbook they actually had for decades. And part of the application process, say you were applying to Princeton or, or Yale, an Ivy League school, uh, they, they, part of the application process would be that you actually had to sign a letter of intent, a letter of intent that would state this, I will pray every day. Think about this. I will pray every day. I will read the Bible, have a devotional life, and invite others to the same relationship with Jesus Christ. That would be a chair of commitment, wouldn't you say? Today, at least by biblical standards, they're in a chair of conflict. Are you hearing what I'm saying? So you're getting the picture. So we can talk about these things this morning. We're going to just look at a couple examples. What about denominations? Do you know denominations aren't necessarily that bad, but they actually started out of movements, a great, watch this, moving of the Holy Spirit. Like we were just experiencing a move of God, right? During the worship and that, we felt the presence of God. Most major world denominations, whether they practice it or not, were originally birthed out of a great moving, a spontaneous moving of the Holy Spirit, a revival. Uh, I could talk about the Methodist, John Wesley. How many know who John Wesley is? Well, John Wesley was, was the founder of the Methodist. I mean, John Wesley was an on-fire preacher. How many would agree he sat in chair number one? Oh, yeah. Yeah, he was serious. The great awakenings are attributed to the Wesley brothers who crisscrossed across this great land of ours and where they saw revivals break out. And what they would do is they didn't have churches in those days, 1757, 1758, but they would actually come into like a little brush arbor, a uh, little place, they made like a, a, you know, a makeshift area with seats sometimes out of log benches and that kind of thing. And he would come in there on horseback right out of London, England, and he would preach su with such an anointing and such fire of God that people would get saved from the hills and from all over, and the, the crowd would grow night after night. Kind of some of us were singing some of those camp meeting songs before, that there was such excitement and such an anointing and a passion. Are you hearing what I'm saying this morning? That when they got on the horse and they left town, that a church would rise up and the people would say, man, we need to, we need to, we need to establish a work of God here, a Pentecostal, spirit-filled work of God. And so now when you see these little white churches dotted across the landscape of this great land of ours, they were birthed. It's important we understand our history. You can't understand where you're going until you understand where you've come from. Your history is very rich in the fire of revival. Unfortunately, so many are just a shell of what they once were. So we could say that originally they sat in the chair of commitment, but could it be that they slid into the chair of compromise and some into conflict? And I could, I could mention, and I'm not picking on the Methodists, I love the Methodists, but so many others today, they're only going through the motions. So we're talking about being committed today. What chair do you sit in? What chair do you sit in? And I could ask this question. I've asked this question this week. God, what chair do we as a church sit in in 2021? Are we really committed or are we going through the motions? Are we really all in in this thing? And so... When I look at the word, I see that there are churches that started out in the fire, but now they live in the smoke. Sister Jean Swan, I remember Hannah, stood here many years ago 
like her 102nd birthday, and she said, I was born in the fire. How many remember Sister Swan? Oh, yeah. She understood commitment. First chair. She said, I was, I never forget her standing right here on a Sunday night. I was born, I asked her to preach. She said, I was born in the fire, and I refuse to live in the smoke. How many know that's commitment? Can you say praise God? Amen. What chair do you sit in today? What chair do we as a church sit in? Um, you know, your family, many of us had grandparents, right? That when we look back at our grandparents, say, man, they were committed to God come hell or high water. How many know they were committed to God, committed to their family, committed to the church of God, and committed to their country? And many of them would be rolling over in their graves today if they knew some of the animosity that is taking place in our country and in our churches. So we must ask the question, loved ones, today. We must look at ourselves, take a long, hard look in the mirror and say, am I really still in that chair of commitment? Amen? Amen. And so Revelation chapter 2, if you go there with me, Revelation chapter 2. Now Paul, he's talking about earlier on in the New Testament, he's talking about Ephesus uh, the church, it's uh, the book of Ephesians. He's talking about how Ephesus was an amazing church. It was in a demonic city. It was, uh, they worshiped the sexual goddess Diana, uh, who was lewd and nasty, and they were big into idol worship. It was a city filled with idol worship. But yet Paul commends the church at Ephesus on their love. Everybody say their love. How many know if you don't have love, you can't even really say you're a Christian? And it's one thing to say that you love. It's another thing to demonstrate. Amen? People who are committed know how to love. The Bible said God is love. It doesn't say He has love. It says He is, right? The very essence of God is love, right? And so Paul actually 14 times before this, this letter where Jesus wrote to the churches in, in Revelation, I'm going to read to you Revelation 2, Paul said 14 times, that's a church that I commend them for their love. I commend them for their love in these areas. They know how to love God. That's called worship. They know how to love their fellow brothers and sisters in Christ. How many know that's called fellowship? And they know how to love the unlovely, the unsaved, the unchurched. They know how to reach them. How many know that's called evangelism? Okay, so there are three purposes right there, and Paul says that. But my, oh my, you know, in the beginning, they started out as committed. Now, Christ literally has to blast them because they have done this downward slide, as so many have chosen that path. Revelation chapter 2 and verse 1, write this letter to the angel of the church at Ephesus. This is the message from the one who holds the seven stars in his right hand. Who's that? Jesus, right? He's got the whole world in his hand. The one who walks among the seven gold lampstands. I know all the things. Now, this is the words of Jesus. Listen, I know all the things that you do, Ephesus. I have seen your hard work and your patient endurance. I know that you don't tolerate evil people. You have examined the claims of those who say there are apostles, but they are not. And you've discovered they are liars. You have patiently suffered for me without quitting. But I have this complaint against you. You don't love me or each other as you once did at first. Look how far you have fallen. Turn back to me, God says, and do the works that you did at first. If you don't repent, I will come and remove your lampstand. Lampstand actually means witness, your light, the light of the Lord. I'll remove it from its place among the churches. So now if you go to Revelation chapter 3 and verse 15, let's just jump down really quick. I'll put it on the screen for you. I know all the things you do, that you are neither hot nor cold. This is the church at Laodicea, okay? There's seven churches. Two are coastal, the other uh, five are intercoastal. But since you are like lukewarm water, how many of you like to drink lukewarm milk? Anybody? Isn't that disgusting? What's, what do you do when you drink lukewarm milk? Right? How about, do you ever drink sour milk? Anybody ever drink sour milk? Isn't that like the worst, especially if it was like cottage cheese or something like that? What do we do? We spit it out of our mouth. God says is that's the exact same thing that he will do with people who are lukewarm. Ooh, I didn't expect a lot of amen, hallelujah on that one. You see, I have to diagnose the problem, and we have to talk about the problem before we can talk about the solution. Because some people would say, yeah, I'm committed, but they're really not in the chair 
number one. They're in chair number two or worse yet, chair number three. God actually said, I'd rather you be in the first chair or in the last chair. But because you're lukewarm, I'm about to spew you out of my mouth. It's a hard message. I understand. But I'd rather preach and be obedient to what God said to me to say to you and myself. And then I'll rest very well tonight. If you don't believe me, ask my wife how loud I snore sometimes. (laughs) Praise God. So chair one is on fire as a church, right? Uh, Chair three is cold, but chair two is lukewarm. So what chair are you sitting in today? What chair are you sitting in? We could say chair one is all about the power of God. We could say chair two is a form of godliness. It's called compromise. You know, anybody like that? They have a form of godliness. The Bible said there'll be many in the last days that have a form of godliness, but they deny the power thereof. And then the last chair is a chair of conflict where they don't even know God. Generations. Let's think about families for a minute. And there's so many examples in the Bible. Three generations. Let's talk about David. You know, how many know King David was a man after God's own heart? Amen? You know, uh, he wrote Psalm 42. Actually, we sang it before. As the deer panteth for the water brook, so my soul longeth after thee. Isn't that neat? Any hunters in the house? Yeah, David was too. But he saw... As he wrote under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, he he saw, I'm envisioning uh, like a deer running and running and running. And you know how many know they they, they get to a brook where now they're just drinking and drinking. They can't drink fast. They can't get enough. How many understand? That's what David was saying as an analogy. He was saying, as the deer would run from the water brook and pant for that, so my soul, God, longs after your presence. Amen? Amen? Now that's a worshiper, Right? David, I mean, let's talk about David. He's the only guy in all the scripture that 66 chapters in the Bible, in your Bible, are dedicated to David. And he's the only one that God said, now that's a guy after my own heart. That's a guy that's a worshiper. David, when he brought the presence back into Jerusalem, the Bible said he danced. And if you do the geographical, uh, you know, configurations there. He's literally danced, spun, and twirl, disrobed his priestly garments as they brought the Ark of the Covenant back. Some of you are like, Ark of the Covenant? Was that Indiana Jones? Some of you know Hollywood movie stars better than the Bible, okay? They brought the Ark of the Covenant back because it had been captured. It had been stolen. They brought, it contained the presence of the Lord. Watch this. The presence of God David brought it back to Jerusalem, the capital city. Jerusalem is the type of the church today. Did I lose you? How many know the presence of the Lord needs to be restored back into the house of God? Can you say amen? Come on, help me out there. Use those things called hands and let God know you mean business. Amen. So David's a man after God's own heart. First generation, he sat in the chair of commitment. Watch the second generation. He had a son. His name was Solomon. How many know Solomon grew up in the wealth of the kingdom? Solomon, you could say, it would be safe to say, he, he was born with a silver spoon in his mouth. I'm not saying that's wrong. I mean, you have no choice what family you're born into. But understand this. Solomon never had to work for anything. He grew up in, with King David, the most powerful king in the world. So he had all the wealth, all the prosperity. How many know later on in life, Solomon had more wisdom? He had more wealth. And how many of you know he had more women than anybody? And I'm trying to put two and two together here, but I won't say any more about that. The Bible said he had 451 wives and 300 porcupines. (laughs) Oh, sorry. I meant concubines. I mean, he was a powerful guy, right? I mean, think about Solomon. This is David's son. But Solomon compromised in his life. Solomon grew up with so many material things that he became materialistic. And don't take my word for it. Read Ecclesiastes chapter 1 through 4 where you'll see 41 times he mentions personal pronouns. In other words, it's all about me. You ever meet anybody like that? He said, I want, I have, I get this. And actually, it, 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 it was a sad story because he ended his life very miserably. How many understand? He said, I had, I, I, basically, I ascended the hill of fame and fortune to find out it's a barren wasteland on top. 
How many know that would not be chair number one? That would be chair number two, the chair of compromise. And yet David, his father, I don't know what it is about generations, but many times the previous generation had such a commitment, and then the second generation, if we're not careful, loved ones, slides like a slippery slope. And they might come to church, and they might even be born again, but they're not committed to God. They're not committed. They're more committed to their job. They're more committed to their career. They're more committed to the things that they want to do. Maybe it's money. Maybe it's vehicles. Maybe it's, you know, properties or whatever. Maybe it's the stock market. But they're sitting in a chair called compromise. And they had it modeled by a previous generation called commitment. David, the father, man after God's heart. Solomon didn't end well for him. And then we had the grandson, Rehoboam. If you know your Bible, Rehoboam was probably the worst of kings ever. How many know he was absolutely crazy? Did terrible, unthinkable things. The grandson of David, the third generation. So what I'm trying to say today is what chair do you sit in? What chair do you sit in? How many of you understand that before we can even ask what chair our children are sitting in, We've got to answer the question, what chair are we sitting in? Amen? So, again, David, Solomon, Rehoboam. We could talk about, there's so many examples in the Bible. How about Abraham, Isaac, Jacob? Are you hearing what I'm saying? Now, I know any good parent would want their kids to serve God. Amen? We want their kids to be on fire for Jesus. Lynn shared an awesome testimony in the early service, right, about her nephew that she prayed for. He was far from God, but she went on a fast, seek God, and drove almost two hours out of her way and asked me to agree with her and stand with her in faith and tell him what happened, Lynn. Jesus Christ, and it just became very empowered to take authority over something that had been coming against him. Praise God. Amen. And that just happened yesterday. He's on fire for Jesus. Can you say praise God? Amen. Amen. Because she cared for her family. Her, your sister's son? My sister's son, yeah. Yeah. And so I'm trying to say that because people are committed, we can reach family members who are committed. But we have to be careful because some of the best men and women in the kingdom, even in your Bible, just because they were committed doesn't mean that their kids were. Are you hearing what I'm trying to? You see, which, so I'm asking, what chair do you sit in this morning? What chair do your children sit in? What chair do your grandchildren sit in? Amen. Joshua, the end of his life. Let's go to Joshua 24. I'm almost done. Joshua 24, 15. Now Joshua, who came up under Moses, is the leader. And now he's actually about 110 years old when this is recorded in history. If you don't like bloodshed, don't read the book of Joshua. <laughs> it's, it's all wars and, I mean, wiping out civilizations. And all, you know. But Joshua is, is the leader of about a million and a half Hebrew children who have entered the promised land. He's at the end of his life. And here's the words I'm going to read to you. And some of you know this, but let's put it on the screen. Joshua 24, 15. Let's read it out loud. Are you ready? But if you refuse to serve the Lord, then choose today whom you will serve. Would you prefer the gods your ancestors served beyond the Euphrates? Or will it be the gods of the Amorites in whose land you now live? But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Some translations say me and my family. How many of you want your family to grow up serving the Lord? Amen. Just because I grew up in my father's house doesn't mean that I was committed just because I came to church on Sundays doesn't mean I was committed. Does this sound familiar to anybody? Just because I got committed and recommitted my life to God, how many know that didn't make my kids committed? Can you say amen? Because watch this, just one generation. So Joshua says, hey, I'm drawing a line in the sand here at the end of my life. You choose this day. You're now living in the land of the Amorites who you conquered through battle. And I led you into that battle under the leading of God. 
He said, but now I'm drawing a line in the sand and you need to make a decision. This is like the general's final message. He said, choose this day who it is that you'll serve. I don't know about you, but as for me and my house, me and my family, we will serve the Lord. That's a bold statement right there. And he's saying, you know what? Your non-decision is a decision for the chair of conflict. You've got to make a choice. You can't put that on somebody else. You can't say, and I've heard men say this, you know, oh, my wife takes the kids to church. Sir, you're the leader of that house. And you're going to stand before God one day, not just for your own life, but what you did in front of your kids. And God is watching you. One generation later, I'll go back to the original text, Judges 2.10. Watch this. It said, and after that generation died. What generation? Joshua's generation. After they died, like, you know, he raised the bar and said, you've got to choose this day whom you're going to serve. And they crossed over the line and said, we're with you, Joshua. We're going to be in chair one. We want to be committed to God. The Bible said that after that generation died, look at Judges, the very next book, 2.10. After that generation died, another generation grew up who did not acknowledge the Lord or remember the mighty things that he had done for Israel. It's a commitment thing. Look at your neighbor and say, we got to be committed. So what's the antidote? Well, let me give you, let me give you a couple points before we close here today, okay? Number one, I hope you'll write this down. If you know which chair you sit in, you'll know where you are spiritually. you got to be honest. If you know which chair that you're sitting in this morning, which one of those three, you'll know where you actually are spiritually. Amen? It's a commitment thing. You become what you're committed to. Great people, we talked about this last week, are just ordinary people who committed to something much larger, much greater cause than their own personal life, right? If you commit to nothing, you'll be nothing. Here's the second point. The Bible and history tell us that the slide, the downward slide, is usually from wherever you currently sit. So wherever you currently sit, it's a downward slide with your family. Think about that. I'll talk to just the families just for a moment here. Uh, To know which chair you sit in, here's the third point. Probably, I mean, which chair, I'm not speaking this, I'm just saying I've been around this my whole life, folks. Trust me on this. I know what I'm talking about here. Chances are the next generation will be in the next chair. They won't be in first chair. If you're in first chair, they'll be in second. If you're in second, they'll be in third. They'll be in conflict. So here's the question. How do I stop my family from a downward slide? Here's the first one. You ready for the good news? Because it's applicable. It's application now. Set a godly example for them. Set a godly example for your kids, right? How many of you had parents that set a godly example for you? Amen. And I know not everybody did. I understand that. We're living in a post, we call it post-Christian era. But set a godly example for, in other words, live right. God says, be holy as I'm holy. You can't get frustrated at your kids, sir, when you haven't lived for God and expect them to go to church. Can you say amen? Put the next point up there. Create a godly environment for your family. Amen? You can do this. Amen? You can do this. If you don't have a family, you need to do it anyway. If you're going to sit in the chair and say, I'm a Christian, look, Napoleon, you know that story, right? Napoleon had a guy in his army that had the same first name, but he was a coward. And when Napoleon heard about it, remember Napoleon, little guy, about four foot, always had his hand like this. <laughs> he, he got on his big horse, but he was a powerful guy. He was short in stature, but he was strong and powerful. He rode back to the ranks and he said, take me to the guy that bears the same first name as me. I want to meet this man that's a coward. Every time there was a battle, the guy would run the other way. He'd retreat. That's what he did. And Napoleon, they brought him all the way back, thousands and thousands of warriors. And he got off this horse. And this is what he said, change your name or live up to it. I would say to Christians, American Christians, change your name or start to live up to it and sit in the first chair of commitment. If you believe that, why don't you clap your hands this morning? 
Hallelujah. So listen, in other words, and here's the third one, provide a godly experience for your kids. Provide a godly experience. Don't tell your kids to go to church when you don't go to church. I've been around this my entire life. You want to talk about health coaching and, and that kind of thing? Talk to Regina. She's, she's amazing at it, okay? That's her wheelhouse. This is mine. I can tell you firsthand. Fathers that say, you know, you need to go to church, and they don't go, your kids will never make chair number one without the grace of God. And, and, and they'll say things. You see, you nullify. Kids are so smart today. How many know your kids are like smarter than you are in some areas? I know it's hard to admit. Come on, it's a humility thing. They can figure, they can see right through you. If you say, you know, it's real important in this house that we belong to a church, and then you're only going to church once every four or five months when you don't have anything else going on, or maybe you want to find out what they're doing over there. You don't have a football game or a sports activity. Oh, did I say that? <laughs> Let me take that back. Oh, it's too late. I'll just spew it out of my mouth. How many know people live like this? And then you wonder why your kid's a mess when he's a teenager. Or you wonder when he gets married and his bride walks down the aisle and you have that wonderful family day, that when they are married and they have kids, that their kids aren't in church any longer. Is this okay this morning? Whether it's okay or not, I'm going to preach it because I want to be obedient to the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. It's a commitment thing. It's about being in chair number one. Change your name or live up to it. Choose you this day whom you will serve. As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. It's not always easy to serve God. In fact, it's a hard road many times. It's way easier to go the way of the masses. And I commend you here today. We're, I mean, this place is about full, you know. But there's also room for more people. At the beginning of a new year, unlike ever before, we've got to reevaluate and reprioritize. Where are we at with this thing? Are we really? Listen, I don't serve God because I'm a pastor. Are you kidding me? I serve God because I understand that God is calling us to a much higher standard to live by. I serve God when I'm in my home. I serve Him when I'm in my car. And like that beautiful song we sang before, holy, holy, holy. This week I was driving up after all the chaos that has broken out. And God only knows. I hope they find what the real truth is. It, when I have people tell me all the time, I don't even know what to believe anymore, Pastor. I don't know if, if I could believe the Democrat. I don't know if I could believe the Republican. I don't care. Let me tell you, you, can, what you should only thing you should really believe and will never change is the Word of God. The infallible, immutable unprecedented word of God concerning your life, concerning your family. Choose you this day whom you will serve. Don't get in a chair of compromise and expect your kids to somehow come out all right. They won't. You know, and we allow things in our lives if we're not careful as parents. Trust me, I'm a parent. I raised three boys. I, there was times I wanted... <laughs> My son used to get called up to the principal's office on a regular basis, and it wasn't for a promotion, okay? <laughs> I wanted to send him to go be with Jesus, okay? So I live in a real world just like you do. But understand, you can't allow things in your home. I know this is old school, but it's still the Word of God. You can't allow things, sir, ma'am, in your home with your kids, you know, like, and because when you do that, no matter what you say, you're actually sitting right here. You're in a chair of compromise. Well, you know, they're teenagers. No. You're the parent. You, you're the man, okay? The one with the mustache, all right? <laughs> Lead. You know, you got to be a leader in your home. Don't be a wuss. I said that last week. And my good friend Mike is here today. And I said in the 9 a.m., I said, don't be a wuss. Be committed. You know, and we had, a, we had crazy snow last Sunday, right? Mike said, I, I saw that on the, on the TV or what was it, the live stream. 
He said, yeah, I'm going to call me. He said, I wasn't feeling good. I was sick as a dog. He goes, I got off that couch, got dressed. I drove through that snowstorm all the way up past Moscow somewhere. And he said, I'm sitting right here today because I'm committed. I'm in chair one. Can you say amen? Praise God. Amen. Amen. Worship team, come back. Don't compromise. Your kids are watching you. Well, I know, you know, I know their eyes are kind of red and, you know, they came in from that party and, you know, they went straight to the bedroom. Maybe I, maybe, you know, I just, you know, let me tell you something. You deserve what you tolerate. Are you kidding me? My mom would have beat the devil out of me. When I was high as a, when I was away from God, lit up, you know, I would come in. My mom was the, oh my God, you have no idea, friend. <laughs> We had our old Parsons had a bright yellow floor. I mean, who puts a yellow floor? It was like 70s, you know. I would come home doing all the boogling and all the stuff, you know, and I was tired. My eyes were like a road map out singing and in the band, all that. Would, you know, do I need to say any more about that? Thank God, Gary, those are BC days. <laughs> Whoo, Jesus. And my mom would flip that bright exam light on. Where were you? <laughs> Anybody have a mom like that? Oh, I have. I'm just like, oh, I don't want to see her right now. I found these in your pocket. Washing the clothes, you know. Oh, God, Jesus. I'm like, mom, it's such a headache right now. Please, I just want to go to bed. It's 4 o'clock in the morning. I will not sleep until I know that you're home and you're safe. And by the way, I'm watching you, and so is God. That's the way I came up. I was in my 20s. I told you this last week. My mom was... She's old school Pentecostal. You don't pull any wool over her eyes. I mean, they would beat the devil out of us when we were kids, John. I'm telling you the truth. They had that big old oak paddle, Dave. I don't know if you had it, but like I made one. I still, we still have it, right? It's in your office now. When my son, Tyler, was like four years old, I, I fashioned a nice oak paddle. And I drilled holes in it so it would go. <laughs> Anybody grow up in a house like that? My son come down the, uh, the steps one night of the basement, our old house in the country, you know, and he had these little feety pajamas on. I said, Dad, what you, what you doing? I said, I'm making something. He said, can I help you? I said, sure. <laughs> he said, what, 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 what are we making? Dad, I had a drill press in my old house. And I said, what are we making? I said, we're making a paddle for you. He went... Mom! Mom! <laughs> Take care of him, Mom. He's going to hurt me. <laughs> Let me tell you something. The kids are serving God today. A hard chair is commitment. A medium chair is compromise. And a lazy boy chair is called conflict. Why do you think we have so much hell in the world today? Because we've allowed so much hell in our families, in our homes, in our lives. And we want God to somehow do some kind of a miracle. Listen, you, there's two parts to every miracle. There's God's part and there's my part. You got to choose this day who you'll serve. Unlike ever before, folks, make sure the kids are in the house of God. Don't tell them it's important and you don't go. Your actions speak way louder than your words. Can you say amen this morning? Man, as for me and my house, we'll serve the Lord. So I got to provide godly experiences. Bring them to church. Put them in the children's ministry out there. Get them in youth group on Saturday nights. I'm watching a live stream. Those kids are on fire. Some of those teenagers are in the first chair, and some of us adults are in the middle chair. Did you ever meet a Christian when they're brand new? I mean, they just, they, 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 don't, they don't get all stressed out over it. They don't get involved in church politics. They don't, they don't get involved in, you know, who's, who's holding the microphone. They like come into church. I had one guy come in and said, Pastor, like, you wouldn't even believe what I read this week in the book of Palms. Yeah. And it's like feed little birds. They're so happy. Do you remember when you were first saved? Do you remember when you first committed to God? It seemed like the grass was greener and the sky was bluer and you just couldn't get enough. You're just drinking in the presence of the Lord. What happened? What happened to us? Could it be that our focus is focusing on the wrong things? Could it be that we're so consumed with the instability in our country? Listen, our call is to pray. Our call is to worship God. 
let me tell you, when you're squeezed, it's like a grape. You know this, what's on the inside is going to come out. Jesus, Jesus, help us, Lord, to be committed in these last days. Help us, God, not to be people of compromise. Amen? I have so, there's, I, it's just God is burning this thing in my heart. I, I, I can't let it go. But God, I don't want to be. I don't want to get soft in this thing, man. I don't want to get comfortable in this thing. Comfort is the killer of passion. The killer of passion. We get all comfortable, and the next thing you know, we're all miserable. We have everything we want, and we start drifting from God. Look at Solomon's life. No one ever will own more than Solomon. No one will ever have more wisdom than Solomon. And, and let me tell you, wisdom isn't, there's nothing wrong with that, but wisdom actually cost him even more so to regress in his faith. Just read it. It's in Ecclesiastes. This is in your Bible. He got to the end of his life. He's absolutely miserable. And then his son, Rehoboam, just goes like right off the deep end. Literally almost led the nation of Israel into complete, utter desolation and ruin as a leader. God, church, we've got to come back to God. We've got to, we've got to do what he said. Repent. Come back. I know of your works. I know you do good things. I know you feed people at the pantry. I know that you, you put stuff out on the broadcast and all that. And there's good things here. But as your pastor who loves you, believe me, it's going to be with you. I'm going to dedicate your babies. I'm going to visit you when you're in the hospital. We're going to bury your dead. We're going to marry your young people. I'm saying this like I feel the urgency of the hour we're living in now. This is not a time to be asleep. This is not a time to... Jesus, help us, God. Help us, Lord, to be people who are on fire for you, God. Help us to be committed to you, Jesus. Jesus, Jesus. I want my kids, I want my, my grandbabies to say, you know what, my grandpa, he wasn't a perfect man, you know. But my, oh my, did he ever have a walk with Jesus. Yeah. This church was born in the fire. This church was born by immigrants from the old country, you know. They dug the basement out by hand. Let me tell you, that's commitment. I tell you about my parents. I tell you about different ones. Most of them are gone home now. And yet I was so blessed to have eyewitness, eyewitness account of people who were all in, man. They weren't fair weather Christians. I'm not saying you are. Don't take this as a personal thing. You just got to answer the question. What chair do you sit in? Which one is it? Everybody stand to your feet with me. Wow, what a powerful message. Now be sure to subscribe and click the bell to be notified for the latest video. And until next time, remember, we love you. God loves you. And may God's richest blessing be yours.